entered the discussion breaking out of Australia's neoliberal straitjacket, the People's Economic Alternative Project. Our speakers on the subject is, first of all, Professor Frank Stilwell. He needs no introduction. We know him very well. Thank you, Joe. Well, we live in exciting times. Uh, interesting times. Interesting, indeed. We've got a new treasurer in Australia. His name is Scott Morrison. And he's hit the track running. Uh, work, save, invest. That's it. That's it. Off you go. Shoot, shoot. That's it. <laughs> oh, oh uh, and I forgot, yes, there is one other thing, isn't it? Thanks, thanks. There is no revenue problem. Uh, and certainly no need for taxes on the wealthy. Or, or even a GST. Uh, although my good friend uh, Mike Baird um, seems to have a somewhat different line on that. But we liberals can live with uh, some disagreements. So uh, on with the motley, and let's get on with cutting weekend penalty rates. Yes, this is the program, ladies and gentlemen. It's an exhortation to work, save, and invest, and an encouragement to do so by uh, some policy measures such as cutting wages. Good, isn't it? Good, isn't it? It has a somewhat familiar ring to it, too. So it seems that the change of Australian government hasn't changed anything of any significance other than the personality of the chap at the helm. And that is presumably not going to save Australia, but they hope it's going to save the coalition government. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's get serious. An alternative economic strategy is needed. Indeed, work, save, invest is, no, it has a certain sort of homely ring, and it's a three-word slogan. We, we, of course, we familiar with the importance of reducing all major policies to three-word slogans. Uh, but anyone who studied economics seriously, particularly Keynesian economics, the ideas generated by a man widely regarded as the greatest economist of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, would tell you that as a recipe for macroeconomic success, this is worse than useless. Because work depends upon the availability of jobs, first and foremost. And if people are saving an increasing proportion of their incomes, the number of jobs will be shrinking because it's consumption, not saving, that drives a capitalist economy. Now, if a capitalist economy is expanding, then savings will follow. But the savings follow the investment. In other words, investment drives expansion, the accumulation of capital, that increases incomes, generates more jobs, and enhances people's capacity to save. The notion that people's savings will somehow inexorably flow into productive investment is pre-Keynesian thinking that I think most intelligent economists would recognize uh, failed the test of the Great Depression in the 1930s and certainly is not relevant in, in the current economic conditions. And as for the lack of a revenue problem in Australia, well, think about the simple arithmetic. If there is a growing budgetary deficit for the federal <laughs> government, it must be to do with either one or other of two things, or possibly both. A shrinking proportion of revenue to GDP or a growing proportion of expenditure to GDP and in practice in Australia it's a bit of both and that's why there's a fiscal problem for the federal government and frankly it is a growing problem and it is not attributable purely to uh, the uh, 
spending propensities of the last Labour government. Indeed, if one wanted to track it back historically, the more important phase that created that fiscal problem was the period when Peter Costello was Treasurer of Australia, when the revenue was rolling in and he gave it back to the wealthy. He failed to invest in any forms that would help us to have sustainable budgetary balance in the future after the mining boom went pop. I mention that because Peter Costello is sometimes regarded as a great Australian treasurer and indeed he did preside over a period of continued economic expansion during the Howard years. But that wasn't his doing. It wasn't his doing. All he did was, uh, to quote Paul Keating from an earlier era, was to piss it up against the wall. <laughs> he, to my mind, is actually a, a major economic criminal in the Australian context because he set in process a set of regressive taxation changes including uh, superannuation concessions to the uh, relatively wealthy uh, which has impoverished the nation in the medium term and has led to budgets such as the one that Joe Hockey tried to introduce uh, a year or so ago, which was widely regarded as a, a, a flagrant violation of, of, of Australian expectations from government policy. Indeed, it was grossly unfair in the way in which it sought to target expenditure cuts at those least able to protect themselves. Well, start again. Start again. That's all you can say. And indeed, that's what Common Action is seeking to do in initiating an alternative people's economic program. Common Action was formed last year uh, with Peter Murphy uh, uh, put in the position of the initial coordinator of this as an attempt to bring together trade unions, community organisations, non-governmental organisations of a progressive inclination to start talking seriously about what is the alternative to this neoliberal agenda. Uh, it hasn't expanded as rapidly as Peter and I and others involved in this initiative would have hoped but with the help of Tom and others from the trade union movement and some uh, uh, people in other community organisations, we're getting together a set of uh, discussion documents that talk about producing videos. In other words, developing a public education awareness and mobilisation process around an alternative economic strategy. And one might say, if that gains momentum, it would, among other things, put pressure on the Labour Party to come up with something coherent that the, uh, as an economic alternative that would have widespread appeal to the Australian population. And as we all know, the pressure is on the Labour Party right now, isn't it? Because the change of Liberal leadership, if nothing else, means that they simply can't expect to coast into government on the basis of Tony Abbott's unpopularity. They have to have something on offer. Well, I've been puzzling away as a political economist uh, for many years uh, about alternative economic strategies, and Tom suggested it might be useful for our discussion tonight if both of us were to reflect on how our own backgrounds and values influence our thinking about these matters. Well, I've, I've spent all my career as an academic. I've been teaching at Sydney University for 45 years, recently uh, retired, but I'm still active in uh, lecturing, uh, researching, writing, supervising postgrad students, editing the Journal of Australian Political Economy. The latest issue is a, a relatively uh, academic exercise in looking at the theories from which we can draw in talking about alternatives to neoliberal economics. 
Uh, it probably doesn't have widespread appeal, but uh, uh, those of Oh, le 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 let's go with a price cut, shall we, to yeah. test the market. <laughs> it, it, it normally sells at 10 bucks, and uh, the politics of the pub special is $5. It, it's a special issue on heterodox economics. In other words, non-orthodox economics thinking. But uh, going back, I mean, actually, to 1982, I was one of the people that developed that Journal of Australian Political Economy special issue on alternative economic strategies uh, at around the start of the Hawke government period. In other words, I left uh, pressure to try to get the accord moving in a progressive direction rather than one limited to simply capitalist economic management. A theme that I took up subsequently in a book called The Accord and Beyond, which argued for that kind of uh, progressive uh, development from the Accord rather than the reactionary turn that it actually took in practice. And then uh, in the early 2000s, I wrote a book called Changing Track, subtitled A New Political Economic Direction for Australia. That didn't exactly create a storm either, uh, but uh, it again, illustrated that it is possible to construct alternative economic strategies that are more secure, sustainable, and fair in the way in which they operate. What's the price on Oh, all, all of these are well out of print by now, so that they're, they're priceless. Thank you very much for, for your question. They're, they're collector's items. <laughs> Collecting dust, mostly. <laughs> so, as a political economist, what can I say about the, the current situation? You can look at things in different layers. Firstly, there's a long-standing analysis that goes back to Karl Marx and beyond about capitalism. In other words, the general characteristics of a capitalist economy, the tendency to exploitation, to periodic economic crises, a tendency of the rate of profit to fall, etc., etc., etc. Long established principles that we can apply to understand the current economic situation. But there's a second level which is more concerned with what's specific about the, the current era. Globalization, financialization, neoliberalism gives capitalism in this era a particularly difficult set of features, particularly from the viewpoint of national governments, or for that matter, nationally based labor movements, trying to uh, get a grip on these forces that are beyond their control. I mean, capitalism is a system that always has been run by capitalists, not by governments or workers. And there's always, therefore, tensions about how governments and workers relate to capitalists. But in this era, th th those tensions are, I think, particularly pronounced. But, so I think it's pertinent to preface my remarks about policy by those background observations because there's only so much that can be done within the confines of one particular country given the limited scope of democratic control over economic processes. We're concerned, in other words, with making adjustments or modifications to a system which is not of our making and not under our control. Having said that, I still think there are some important things that can and should be done. Let me give three examples and then I'll sit down. The first is concerned with creating and wisely using an economic surplus. Now that concept of economic surplus doesn't crop up much in the mainstream economic commentary in the newspapers and on the television, but it's fundamental 
to a political economic perspective on what's going on out there. Any viable economic system has to create a surplus. In other words, it produces goods and services that have higher value than that which is returned to the workers as wages. In other words, we have to produce over and above what we immediately consume. Because otherwise, our tools would wear out and never be replaced. We would never have the capacity to build new infrastructure. Society would wither as the economy uh, failed to produce an economic surplus. Now, at the level of the individual capitalist business, this is obvious enough. Capitalist businesses are there to make a profit. So that is the form of their surplus. But for a nation as a whole, a similar logic applies. The economic surplus is manifest in income flows and profits, rents, interest payments. In other words, the income flows over and above the workers' wages, which are necessary for the reproduction of labor power, of the workforce itself. The economic surplus doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be always pushed to the max. Indeed, in some respects, the more important thing is the way in which that surplus is used. Is it used for social improvement, for better transport infrastructure, for, for environmental uh, repair, and so forth? And how is it distributed? It, does it all go to a small class of capitalists or to some political elite? Or is it more evenly spread across the society so that all can share in the fruits of producing an economic surplus? In the Australian context, to my mind, what that means right now is that we have to find an alternative to the easy forms of economic surplus that we've enjoyed in the past. The lucky country, initially generating an economic surplus through agricultural activities, riding on the sheep's back, and then in more recent times, particularly through mineral extraction. That's the easiest way in the world to generate an economic surplus. Dig it up, ship it out, flog it off. And don't pay the workers too much uh, along the way. That creates an enormous economic surplus. And during the mining boom, with high prices for minerals that we're producing, coal, iron ore, nickel, bauxite, high prices on world markets, easy money. But it's not sustainable for all sorts of reasons. I mean, the, the world prices for many of those minerals has dropped dramatically, but in any case, it's not sustainable from an ecological perspective in the longer term. So some alternative has to be found. Now, it's hard to find it in the manufacturing sector, because that's on the skids too. Textiles, clothing and footwear decimated over the last uh, three decades or so in Australia. Cars, going, going, gone, the whole industry from five producers to none uh, within the next couple of years. Steel, look what's happening down in Wollongong right now. Blue Scope essentially threatening to pull out. The workers, of course, are extremely alarmed. Indeed, the whole of Wollongong and its economic future is on the skids, much as was the case uh, with uh, uh, Newcastle some years back. There are growth points, but looking at the manufacturing sector in general, its share of national employment has been shrinking over a long period of time. And indeed, it is hard to compete with other countries with wages that are a tiny proportion of the worker, workers' wages in Australia in manufacturing industry. So the big challenge is to find new forms, new sources of economic surplus. Now some of 
Malcolm Turnbull's rhetoric is on the right track here, I think, when he talks about uh, the need for innovation, the need for development of service industries, education, health, in which Australia can be world leaders in technology, in distribution, in, in the development of those kind of uh, sunrise industries that will replace the sunset industries that are in decline. This is nice rhetoric, but it's actually very difficult to put it into practice. And even Malcolm Turnbull, who's been the Minister for Communications, is in charge of installing a second-rate broadband system and presumably won't change from that policy because of how deeply embarrassing it would be to admit that they got it wrong. So there's a certain sort of lock-in here uh, which historically hasn't always been the case. We've had vibrant institutions such as the CSIRO pushing on the boundaries of scientific advance and the dissemination of that knowledge into industry. But uh, in recent times, that has not been a striking feature. So something needs to be done to regenerate those processes. CSIRO, TAFE, of course, has a major role. Uh, vocational education more generally. And secondly, and following on from that reasoning, this suggests the need for a national economic plan. This sounds like very old-fashioned talking, I know, because in the modern era, we leave everything to the market, don't we, ladies and gentlemen? We don't plan because the market knows best. Well, the market's delivered us into the situation that we now find ourselves with a shrinking economic base and shaky economic prospects for the future. Faced with a major crisis, governments historically have planned their response. Faced with a war, governments have planned the mobilization of resources to meet the challenge. And it seems to me that uh, in the economic circumstances and also in the circumstances of ecological stress that we now find ourselves, we need some such plan. We need to identify the industries to which we want to reallocate the resources and we need to identify those that we are going to manage in a planned decline. Coal mining, it's got to go. It's got to go. It's not a sustainable industry for the future. But it, we can't just sort of leave it at that and say, oh, no new mines and we'll close down the old ones as soon as we, we, we can get the political muscle to do so. That's going to be a tremendously painful process for workers who are caught up in that dislocation. So planning requires working with unions working with uh, educational institutions, particularly in that tertiary education sector, to ensure that the workforce skills are, are redeployed into areas where people can indeed make useful, productive contributions. You would think, for example, in the Australian case, that solar energy would be an obvious standout. Yet Germany, with all its lack of uh, sunshine relative to uh, our bountiful supply, is streets ahead of us in this regard. We should be taking lessons from these other countries that have indeed grappled much more effectively with the need to plan transitions to sustainable futures. And the third element that I think needs to be right there in, in the uh, focal po focus of public discussion is the redistribution of income. Because if we're going to cooperate on these matters of crucial importance, we've all got to have fair shares in the consequences of what happens. We all know that the capacity to get people to cooperate depends upon the perception of a stake in, in the processes and uh, in the, the fruits of that cooperation. That's true in a household, it's true in a, a football team, in any institution, 
cooperation depends upon some sense of fairness in the way in which the participants work together. Well, of course, we're moving in exactly the reverse direction right now with growing gap between rich and poor. So repairing the federal budget, it seems to me, gives us the opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. If we recognise that there is a revenue problem and that it has to be addressed by progressive tax reform. In other words, those tax policies that Costello initiated need to have to be need to be reopened for consideration. The uh, superannuation tax benefits that are mainly uh, gained by the wealthy has to be reversed. The uh, dividend, uh, the, the, the capital gains benefits, which mean the income from capital gains is taxed at a much lower rate than the income from work. That has to be changed, sure. Why should income from fruitful, windfall gains be taxed less than the incomes from <coughs> hard yakka? It doesn't make sense. Negative gearing, likewise, uh, uh, introduced originally to try to help problems of housing affordability by encouraging investment in rental housing has simply become a taxation lurk. It, it, there's no evidence whatsoever that it helps to create affordable housing. It's simply a wrought for those with, with uh, funds able to avail themselves of, of, of that uh, loophole in our taxation arrangements. But there are many others too, and I mean, of course, the, the Abbott government got rid of the carbon tax and the, the mining tax. Oh dear. No, 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 uh, no problem of revenue, ladies and gentlemen. Well, they brought it on themselves in part. We could draw up a more comprehensive list, and indeed we might return to that in the discussion. But uh, I, I want to finish on just one suggestion that if Labour Party wanted to take up, uh, I think it could be quite a game changer in linking together social security reform and taxation reform. And that's the possibility of a basic citizen's income. In other words, if all people received a basic income, not a basic wage, for workers, but an income irrespective of whether you're working or not, irrespective of your uh, financial and family circumstances, then that would create a flaw which would ensure that no one need ever live in poverty. It wouldn't be a bad start for a decent society that believes in the principle of equity. Because then, as Eric Olin Wright argued in his recent Wheelwright lecture at the University of Sydney, on that secure basis, we could indeed be more risk-taking in our personal lives. We might even get involved in the process of creating uh, businesses, providing services to each other in ways that are fruitful, productive, and socially beneficial. And we might be on the way towards establishing a decent, steady state economy.